There we go, everybody. Where are the rest of you? I'm right here. Right here. Did you all read five? No. All right. Temple. Can I? No, we've got to talk about the fucking King of the Ring. Don't even tell me that this wasn't... That was great. Well, there was a great match in there. There was a few great It matches. wasn't all great. But uh, we watched all of the tournament matches, mm-hmm. and we watched the uh, Hulk Hogan versus Yokozuna match, yes. right? Yes. yes. I did not watch Shawn Michaels and Crush. No. no. I, I did not, not watch the... that, that eight-man or whatever that looked like it was about no. five fucking hours long. <laughs> God damn, was that match long or what? That match you didn't watch? Then they do this long fucking match. Well, I, I'm skipping on the on the Apple TV. Like, you know, they got the thing, and you can you can see as you're going what's happening really fast. And I'm like, fuck, I've been fast running for an hour. They're still fucking wrestling. And then they do this insufferably long eight-man, which I can't imagine was any good. And then it's finally time for the main event, and they literally start a match going, I hope we have enough time to show you this whole match. The whole finals of the King of the Fucking yes. Ring Tournament. They have a curfew. Because it could go long. Time. I'm like, well, what do we have a fucking eight man for? Anyway, let's get going. All right. Why did I write so much about this show? We watched WWF King of the Ring June 13th, 1993. We open with round one, Razor Ramon versus Brett the Hitman Hurt. And this is, this is a stage. It, it, it's almost a mistake to review these three Brett matches in uh, separately because they did not take place in a vacuum. They all took place on one show. So he went out to have three different matches, but at the same time, there's a common storyline throughout all of them that leads up to the finish of the finals. So they have this match. It's back and forth until Brett takes that chest first bump into the turnbuckle. And he's doomed. And Razor's working him over and working much faster here. It's funny, they have a 15-minute time limit, which sounds like a long match here in 2022. But the announcers are pushing, it's only 15 minutes! you got to hurry! You don't have time! So they're working very, very fast, and Razor goes for the uh, Razor's Edge. But Brett escapes that, turns that into a backslide, and then turns that into a small package. He gets a 2.9999 count. Holy shit, what a fucking near fall that was. <laughs> These fucking fans went crazy for that small package near fall. And then Razor tries the back superplex, but Brett turns that into a high cross, lands on top. He wins, and Razor loses. And one of my favorite things about this show is when guys lose, they're knocked out of this tournament. They're fucking pissed. Now, Razor's got a whole losing streak gimmick going anyway, so it's, uh, it's icing on top of the uh, cake for him. But he loses this match, and there's no point in attacking Brett. That won't accomplish anything. He lost anyway. He's just disgusted with himself for losing. And uh, he, Razor's the big, scary guy. Brett was the superior, not just the superior technical wrestler, but the superior counter wrestler. He was always several steps ahead of Razor, and that's where he got the win. And this, it was a very good match. At the same time, they did not blow everything on the opener. Dude, I thought this match was so good. Just an old school, basic, classic style wrestling match. And, you know, it's it's funny because business was horrible during this period. And, you know, you think of, of WWF and, and WWF style and Hulk Hogan and your Earthquakes and your Andres and your Warriors... And uh, there's always kind of that that thing where, like, if you want to see real good wrestling, you got to watch, like, WCW or or Japanese pro wrestling or All Japan or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, there were people in there that could fucking work. And when they got in there together, the matches were fucking awesome, as we were going to see with Mr. Perfect and uh, Bret Hart coming up. But uh, even this one here was just, there was nothing flashy. There was nothing special. Like, the high spots, nowadays the high spots are just done so fast. Like, have you ever watched Phoenix do a high spot? It's just like boom, 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 boom. It's so fast you can barely tell what's going on. But their high spots were like, you know, I, I don't know if it was, yeah, I would think it was this match. There, was this the one where they're fighting for the backslide and Brett walks up the ropes and, and yep. flips? So, yeah. Like, that was so fucking slow. Because the idea was you're gonna you're gonna understand what Brett was doing in the reversal. He was gonna get uh, the backslide, but instead he walk and he walks up the ropes real slow. He slowly rolls over the back. He slowly hooks the guy for the small. And these fans fucking bought this small package. 
And I just thought this was a great match. I also thought it was a great match. Um, the fans were on Razor from the get-go, chanting one, two, three. Of course, uh, next week we'll be reviewing uh, whether or not Kid accept his $7,500 offer to, to wrestle him again. Uh, Brett was the uh, awesome technical wrestler. Uh, Razor was the... Um, he threw strikes and, and power moves, and uh, I, uh, I had an epiphany. Brett is awesome. The fuck kind of? Let me write that I, fucking down. Yeah, I know. I God. was being facetious, but this is probably the, uh, probably the best three matches a guy could ever have on this show. He, he was the man on this show. Who was not the man was Giant Gonzalez. He's not on the show, but we saw an angle where Undertaker and Giant Gonzalez are brawling in the corner. And Undertaker, even though he's winning the brawl, his focus is so focused in on the Giant, he doesn't notice Mr. Hughes is murdering Paul Bearer behind him and stealing the urn. And then Mr. Hughes goes to hit the Undertaker with his urn. And he hits him so hard, he drops the urn, and it falls out of the ring. And Harvey has to go fetch it for him, so he hit him a second time. The giant, meanwhile, just leaves. Just walks away. He's, his time is done. So, King of the Ring match, Mr. Perfect versus Mr. Hughes. You know what's funny is I have never seen much in old Mr. Hughes. And... Uh, and I should note that they had a monstrously botched spot in this mm -hmm. match. I think Mr. Hughes was going going for a power slam. Or a spine buster. Or something. It may not even have been his fault. It might have been perfect going on the wrong side. But one way or the other, they just totally fucked it up and fell down. But with that said, Mr. Hughes did some cool shit at the beginning of this move. match. move. This fucking guy hit those ropes so fast. Yes. And they had a couple of high spots where I thought, God damn, this might actually end up being a good match. It didn't, but it showed flashes. He had potential. Yes, of Which brilliance. he never, ever realized. No. So the key to this match is, in the middle of it, in addition to wrestling three times in this show, spoiler, uh, Brett has to also do some promos. So he's doing an inset promo. He's going to face the winner of this match, and they ask him, who would you rather face, Mr. Hughes or Mr. Perfect? And Brett thinks about it, and he says, well, Mr. Hughes has a lot of power, hits very hard, is a strong man. Mr. Perfect has the stamina. I would rather face the stamina. I'd rather face Mr. Perfect. Also, I like him better. And he said this in a completely, it was as complimentary as it could possibly be, where I was saying I'd rather face that one person. Now, at the exact moment when Brett says that he'd rather wrestle Mr. Perfect, that was when Mr. Hughes fucked up a spine buster. So, like, <laughs> I wonder if he was watching. So they're doing this match, and Mr. Perfect starts his comeback. Come, Mr. Perfect starts his comeback, and Hughes grabs the Undertaker's urn and hits him with it and is disqualified. Well, that sucked. That's one guy that didn't really get mad about losing that tournament match now, isn't it, Vinny? He didn't give two Fs, no. God, that stupid fucking bullshit finish. This. It's amazing, too, when you look at this tournament, because it's like, they, they had no problem beating Razor Ramon. They had no problem beating Bam Bam Bigelow. They had no problem beating Mr. Perfect. But God damn, we got to protect that fucking well, Mr. Hughes. Well, he's Mr. Because Hughes. he's facing the Undertaker. Yes, yes. Well, maybe he should have been in the fucking tournament then. Yeah, this this is easily the best Mr. Hughes match I think I've ever seen. And it wasn't the wow. best. I mean, probably, but yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe how fast he was moving. He, it was, he was incredible. He was athletic. He was not a good wrestler. Mr. Hughes impressed He would kill me. it at the NXT Combine. All right, Bam Bam Bigelow versus Hacksaw Duggan. Uh, do you, are you going to recap the interview with Gene, Bret Hart, and Mr. Well, Perfect? When we get to it, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. So what I got out of this match is we talk about how guys are big in terms of height and weight, but sometimes guys are just big. And it's Bam Bam Bigelow and Hacksaw Duggan. And they're about the same height. And if you really look at it, Bam Bam's like 100 pounds bigger. But Hacksaw is such a, just a, a giant man. His head is so huge. His hands I'm are so I'm not sure huge. that Bam Bam's 100 pounds bigger, dude. I mean, I think it's a lot closer than you think because fucking be. Hacksaw. 
is huge. Well, here's the thing, too. Uh, I'm going to bring up myself, for example. Okay? I am uh, about 138 pounds, and I look heavier. Okay? But I'm not. And it's because I have a, I have a very, very, I have very small bones. My wrist is like, you know, six and a quarter inches or something like that. I, I got very, very small bones. Hacksaw fucking Jim motherfucking Duggan. This guy does not have small bones, okay? No. This fucking guy, he's probably got like a nine-inch wrist. I mean, he is a big, what's the term they use? Raw-boned, ham-fisted, big motherfucker. I mean, he's probably only like 50 pounds less than Bam Bam Bigelow. He's a big, giant hoss of a man. Yes, he is. And uh, they had a hoss fight, and it was only about six minutes. It was much better than I expected. I was not expecting much, but it over it over delivered. It over achieved. Because Hacksaw, here's the thing with Hacksaw, he's not very. He's like like I don't say he's not good, okay? Because he's great at being Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and that's the key. Like he's not going to do anything crazy. His stuff doesn't look all that great, but few men in the history of this business have ever connected with the fans the way that Hacksaw Jim Duggan has, and he can sell. And yeah. he can connect. Yes. And that's all he fucking needs. And so these people get into this guy's matches. And he doesn't have to do a lot of shit. So this was way better than I expected. Uh, by the way, I just measured eight and three quarters. Your wrist, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, okay. my wrist. Good. No, Vinny, is cock. Oh, Brian. Measured his dick on the air. Of course he's talking about his wrist. I guess. See, the camera's only shooting from the sternum up. You can measure anything down there. So it's Bam Bam Bigelow versus Hacksaw Duggan. Bam Bam sells a rib injury early. He takes a shot in the turnbuckle. They start selling his ribs. So he can barely move. When he goes to the body stain, he can't get it. But later, when it's time for his comeback, he whips Bam Bam in. Bam Bam in. He puts his head down for a backdrop. Bam Bam goes to kick him, but it's a fake. Because Hacksaw Duggan is a genius. And he <laughs> stands up. And Bam Bam kicks his own leg out of his leg. He goes flying. God, you're as bad as these other shitty commentators. What a fucking genius. He got out of the way of a kick. Yes. That's not a genius. Well, a, a genius, Brian. That's he, no shit. A genius. He set the trap. He, he, he went Vinny, for a backup. It's not genius. To lure him into something. No, a kick. it's not genius. The he other guy's not. an idiot. Fair. All There's right, a fine. big difference here. So, bam, bam. He I got a brilliant idea. Einstein wouldn't come up with this idea. I'm going to put my head down, and then when he goes to kick it, I'll move. Ah! And E equals MC squared. Are you aware of that? You know what this equation means? That's not fucking genius. Golly. For Hacksaw Duggan standards. Every time these fucking announcers say something like this, you ridicule them, Vinny. You yeah. ridicule them. Well, I'm a hypocrite. And now you're doing it. Right. It's funny when I do it. No. So Hacksaw finally hits the massive body slam, and he got this giant Bam Bam Bigelow way high in the air. But he misses his three-point stance, goes crashing into the turnbuckle, and Bam Bam pounces, scurries over the top rope. Yes, scurried, I said. Bam Bam Bigelow hits the diving headbutts and wins. I call this a miracle. I don't know about that, but it was it was pretty good. It was six minutes, dude. It was way better than I thought it would be. It was six minutes. I. It was way better than I thought it would be. Wow. Disrespectful. The narcissist Lex Luger. <laughs> Versus Tatanka. Can't so, believe I watched this. This Not match part. had a very good start and a very good last like three minutes. No, it didn't. The last like the four hours in the middle. Bro, listen. First off, when I saw that this went to a 15 minute draw, I was aghast. I was aghast. I was like, Lex, the narcissist, he's going to go 15 minutes. Who was it, Tatanka? But anyway, so then I start watching it. And as I'm watching it, the first couple of minutes aren't bad. And then I start thinking, you know, if this were like a normal WWE pay-per-view match and they were big stars, they'd probably go like, you know, 14 to 17 minutes. You hear draw, and I think your brain thinks, God, they went fucking 30 minutes or whatever. But they really only went 15 minutes. Now, with that said, they did not need to go 15 minutes. And I know you think that the last couple of minutes were good, Vinny. And, I mean, there was some action. Something happened. Okay. That's an upgrade. But the fucking last three minutes of this match. So, Tatanka does some stuff early. Bobby Heenan's just 
boy, he's on. Yeah, you know, he's out of control with these uh, Indian references. And uh, then then uh, Tatanka gets cut off, and he gets cut off until like the eleven minute mark. Okay, there's four minutes left in the match. Tatanka begins making a comeback, and for about one minute, he hits a bunch of moves for near falls. Okay. And then for the final three minutes, Lex Luger just beat his ass. Lex Luger just hits him with move after move after move after move. And then they're like, there's one minute left. And I'm thinking, okay, well, high time old uh, Tatanka here got a couple of near falls on Lex here as the time limit expires. No, Lex hits him with another move. And he hits him with another move. And he hits him with another move. And I'm thinking, Tatanka's got to hit one fucking move, and the time limit expires in the rest. Nope. Lex hits him with another fucking move. And then Lex just starts fucking walking around the ring, and then all of a sudden you hear, ding, 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 ding. I was like, that is the shittiest fucking draw I ever saw. There was no drama. None. No, no, no. There was no, no, oh, man, the baby face. Nope. It was just like, Thank God the bell rang. Luger was going to kill this guy. He was saved by the bell. <laughs> God. Then uh, Lex is all mad, and the announcers are like, it's your fault, dummy. Well, you had him down. Why don't you cover him? What are you walking around for? And I'm thinking, wow. I hope Tatanka doesn't listen to the commentary. They sure buried him. The guy's practically dead. Why aren't you covering him, you dummy? Yeah, they really got Tatanka over here. Fuck. This match sucked. It did. It Thank did. you. The um the very first part of the match, Lex is out first and he's got this full length mirror. Tatanka's music is playing. Lex notices Tatanka coming down. Tatanka's outside glad handing kids and he's doing his war dance. And Lex goes back to flexing in front of the mirror because he is a narcissist. Narcissist. Got to put the pronunciation right. And Tatanka sneaks into the ring, gets behind the mirror, and hits Lex Luger with the mirror by pushing it over. And Lex has the audacity to look surprised. It's actually even better than that because somewhere in here, as Tatanka is just being Tatanka, he's minding his own business, as you noted, high fiving kids or whatever. But Lex jumps him and the bell rings. So Lex started the fight. Uh, yes, yes. Roughed him up a little bit, then threw him out of the ring, and the bell rang. So even though Lex started the fight and the match had begun, he took his eye completely off the ball and went back to flexing in the mirror. And so when Tatanka pushes the mirror over onto him, Lex had it coming. That part was great. And then like the, the, the middle 10 minutes of this, there is a point where Lex is a chin lock. I swear to God, it's like three minutes. Ugh. And Bobby Heenan begins to sarcastically chant, yes, yes, a chin lock. You got him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thumbs down for that one. Now we get to Mean Gene. <laughs> okay, so they had the Bret Hart insert where Bret is asked who you would like to wrestle tonight. Mm-hmm. And in, he's just as nice as can be. And he points out he wants to face perfect because he's a great athlete and a great wrestler. And he likes the guy. So Mean Gene starts by throwing Brett under the bus. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. like, so, Brett, uh, earlier you said that you'd prefer to face Mr. Perfect. Is that because you think that he would be an easier road? And now Mr. Perfect is like, what the fuck did this guy say that for? And then, you know, Brett's caught off guard. So, and Brett's great here because he starts mumbling and he's like tripping over his own words and acting all nervous. And, oh, fuck, I, you know, I, 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 I did say that, but that's not what I meant. So then Gene's like, What do you mean that's not what you meant? That's what you said. You said that Mr. Hughes was strong and powerful. Are you saying that Mr. Perfect would be easier? And now Perfect's like, yeah, what's that all about? And so Brett and Mr. Perfect start getting in a fucking argument. And then Gene goes, guys, please. I'm like, you started this, you shithead. Oh, that's what we, You you fucking sowed these seeds. Then you make them mad at each other. And now you blame them? That's why Gene is awesome. Golly. We need more stuff like this, but unfortunately there's no Gene. There's no Genes, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's great at his job, but in his storyline, what a dick. 
Absolutely. He was a complete dick. That's his job. To no, his job is to ask questions and be an unbiased announcer or whatever. He's stirring shit up. He's lying. So even when he goes, when he when he tries to move on, and for those of you who are not video subscribers, I'm doing quotes with my fingers. For the, when, when Gene tries to move on, he says, now it's true that you're both second generation, second generation wrestlers. Did your fathers ever fight? God, what a troll. And Brett says, yeah, my dad always won. And now perfectly you weren't raised. My dad beat your dad, he says. And I owe you one for SummerSlam last year. <laughs> so he goes, your dad never beat my dad. Yes. I owe you one for SummerSlam. I'll do whatever I have to win tonight, because I'm a winner. There's a pause. And Brett just says under his breath, you weren't at SummerSlam. <laughs> Perfect goes to fake a handshake, and Brett goes to accept. Perfect says, I got you. Get out of there. I'll kick your ass. This was so awesome. Dude, it was awesome, but it God was damn, what a great. dick that Gene was. If uh, I was Gene, disgusted. You know, when Gene was a little kid, he'd put uh, insects in a jar and shake them up so they could fight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I see your point. Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect. I got to say one thing before you recap it. So uh, their match at SummerSlam was actually two years earlier. It was SummerSlam uh, 1991. Right. And uh, that goddamn fucking match when I was a kid, I'll never forget it. And I remember on whatever the show was, the Monday before the pay-per-view, Mr. Perfect came out and his back was all fucked up. But uh, and he, he like, I think he just beat a jobber immediately because, you know, his back was bothering him. And, uh, and he just kind of – he was there with Coach – and he cut a promo, and he just goes, this will be the greatest match in WWF history. And I was so fucking excited. And I waited all goddamn week. And then they had that match at SummerSlam. And I just remember, I must have watched that match a thousand fucking times. I absolutely loved that match. And I can't remember, like, all off the top of my head, like, at this moment... But I'm positive if we started playing it right now, I'd know every move before it happened. I watched the match so many times. So then they had uh, this match in the King of the Ring. And uh, for 29 years now, I guess it would be, I've thought, you know what? Uh, this match was not nearly as good as their 1991 SummerSlam match. That's my memory of this match. And so I started watching it. And it's fucking awesome. And I'm just, I, I was watching this match thinking, why in the fuck do I not remember this match like I remember the 1991 summer? Because I know I must have watched this show a thousand times. I remember the uh, Yokozuna thing vividly. And, uh, and so about two thirds of the way into the match, I'm thinking, they must have some bullshit finish. There must have been something that happened that fucking soured me on this match, which is why I don't remember it as being like. And by the time this thing was over, I'm flabbergasted. This match was fucking awesome. Absolutely fucking awesome. And now, I gotta go back and watch that SummerSlam 1991 match. Because if it's so much better than this one, as I seem to remember, that has to be one of the best matches I've ever saw in my life. Because this was unbelievable, this match with Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart. God. So they had here in 1993, they basically went out and had a dynamite match. Maybe a little slower pace than most of them, but not much. No. No. <laughs> Dude, they were doing headlock takeovers. Uh -huh. Fucking FTR probably watched this match, and they would have been thrilled to go half that fast on their fucking headlock takeovers. Oh, yeah, there was more. It was There, there was more music between the notes. There for a little yes, little there was a lot of music between the notes. There was some pacing going on, but the, the actual execution of moves, yes. And also fast. the story, because they're both baby faces. And they set it up with the interview with Gene. But in the match, Mr. Perfect was going to play heel. And so they they worked it in such a way where he subtly started doing heel stuff. There was a hair pull here, a hair pull there. And, uh, and you know, by the end, he was working total heel. And then when the match is over, he, he swung back again. But they had to tell that story in the middle of the match as well. Why Mr. Perfect played the heel role in this match. So the key spot, I think, is when Brett gets thrown outside. And as you know, the perfect is a baby face. So he used to hold the ropes open for him. And Brett starts to climb back in. 
And Brett, or excuse me, Perfect doesn't go so far as like kick the ropes into his dick or anything, but he doesn't let Brett get all the way in before he kicks him in the gut and takes over. And he's doing, I wouldn't say he's cheating. I don't call him choking or eye gouging or biting, but he's using closed fist punches. He's he's uh, uh, stomping him in the corner a lot. It's an ugly fight for sure. And it's, it's not just a technical battle, but it's super intense, back and forth the whole way. Brett takes a thousand bumps into the corners and he won't stay down. It's funny because they, 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 they go like, uh, I think it's a 30 minute time. It probably went 15 minutes the whole match. But they go like 10 minutes super fast. And like 10 minutes in, Brett Hoosen hits a superplex and they begin to trade long submission spots. Brett gets a figure four for a minute. Perverted gets a sleeper for a minute. And they start trading elbows. And Brett hits a European uppercut with Macho Man called a lifter. <laughs> Look at that lifter he hit. He was super excited about that. And uh, they go to do a suplex. They're near the ropes. And remember on Rampage when Swerve suplexed Darby and we're like, watch this move. And we, we thought they would do something safer than what they actually did. And this was not as dangerous as that, but they did a suplex from the ring over the ropes to the floor. They both fell out. It was scary as hell. They slowly make their way back into the ring where Mr. Perfect is selling his leg, but he's playing possum. It is a trap. And so he tries to small package Brett but you can't outsmart the master. You can't out-counter-wrestle the best counter-wrestler in the world. Brett reverses the small package. He was still two steps ahead of Mr. Perfect, and Brett wins again. Dude, I there was a spot in this match where Mr. Perfect stomps on Bret Hart's fingers. And, uh, you know, Bobby Heenan used to manage Mr. Perfect, and then they split up and everything like that. And so, you know, Bobby is, he, he's, even though Mr. Perfect is playing heel, Bobby's role is to still dislike Mr. Perfect. But because of the story they're telling, there's certain things that Mr. Perfect does that Bobby approves of, because he's a horrible person. So, uh, so he stomps on Brett's fingers, which, by the way, plays into the main event, because Brett comes out with his fingers taped for the main event. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Bobby Heenan goes, see, that's one of those things that I taught Mr. Perfect. I taught him, I taught him this psychology. And there's deathly silence for a moment. <laughs> and then Jim Ross, and then Mr. And I think it was Randy Savage first goes, I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. And they all move on. And it's funny because it was great psychology, but the term psychology is only used if it's fake. Because stomping on a man's fingers... It's not psychology. No. It's an offensive maneuver to fuck his fingers up. If your psychologist stomps in your fingers, you should change doctors immediately. Yes, but I, I thought that was awesome. And Bret Hart, if you, if you watch all of his matches and the story of this tournament, everything from his first match with Razor, the, inter the inset interview he does, yes. the interview leading to the argument with Mr. Perfect, the match with Mr. Perfect, which is a babyface match, but Mr. Perfect ends up working heel and stomps on his fingers – Leading to Brett doing an 18 minute second match, uh, 12 minute or whatever the first match was. So he's going into the main event having already wrestled for 30 minutes. Meanwhile, the big giant, Bam Bam Bigelow, had a six minute match and then a bye to the finals. And then, as much as I, oh, we can talk about the main event in a minute, but the whole story of Brett's whole tournament, Brett was unbelievable on this show. This was like a one night performance of a lifetime for Brett Hart. But when this match was over, between the interview that Perfect did, the job Perfect did, essentially turning heel in the match, and then turning back babyface after the match, his work, his facial expressions, his reaction to his loss, this was the fucking Mr. Perfect show, this match right here. He was the star of this match. And that's not taking anything away from Brett because he was fucking awesome as well. But this was very much one of the best performances I ever saw out of Mr. Perfect was, was this segment here, this match in the tournament. He was awesome. That's very high praise. This match was awesome. Uh, completely different than the first match that he had with Razor. Uh, that that was a more of a technical match with Razor, even though Rest, Razor was the brawler. He gets in there with Perfect, who's more his size and speed, and they just have a fight. And it was a great fight with some wrestling moves sprinkled in here and there. The uh, the 
suplex out of the ring. Uh, Perfect smashed his back on the ring apron. That did not look fun. Um, But this this was a great match and uh, easily the best thing I've seen all week. So you did not watch... I didn't get a chance. Tanahashi and Ishii. I did not get a chance. Because that was better than this match. (laughs) It was off. In a totally different way. Yes. It was one of my favorite matches I've ever seen in my fucking life, the more I think about it. It was pretty spectacular. I will just summarize it here, Craig. Imagine Tanahashi trying to out Ishii. Ishii. And the other way around. And the other way around. Yes. Yes. Hmm. And they both succeeded to a degree. Yes. God it. damn, that match was awesome. It was it was pretty dang great. We have a Hulk Hogan promo, and I was curious about all this. This is, in hindsight, this was Hulk Hogan's last show with this company in a decade. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a screw. All I remembered is there is a screwy finish in the actual match, and uh, it seemed like they were. My memory was having not seen the show now in several decades. That they just went all out to protect Hogan, probably thinking they would do a rematch down the line. No. And of course. That was not to be. No. He, Hulk Hogan came out here, and from the second he appears to the second he ends, his job is to lay the groundwork for what Yokozuna is going to do next. Hulk Hogan thought he was going to go to Hollywood and never wrestle again. That's clear. Or at least not for a long, long time. He does this promo, and it's a Hulk Hogan promo, and those lines up the pythons and the Hulk and all this. But really, what he's really talking about is America. And yes, he does note that here in Ohio, he is safe from Pearl Harbor sneak attacks and all this, but it's about the red and There's no blue. water nearby, he says. Yeah. There's no water nearby. That's what he said. Listen, he's not a teacher. He's not a geography. No, he's... that's the, his point was, there's no water for our base to be attacked by yeah. Japanese ships in yeah. fucking... Uh, ah. Yeah. So he was on. It's the red, white, and blue. It's the heartland of the USA here in Ohio. Yokozuna, what you gonna do when America and the largest guns in the world destroy you? So because of the match, it's Hulk Hogan versus Yokozuna. And again, Hogan by this point obviously knows this is gonna be his last match for a long, long time. And I don't know if he'd think he'd be gone for a decade, but he he knows. And he comes out and. For about 15 seconds, you can just kind of see him taking it all in. But at the same time, it's also set up he's standing next to the video wall. And so they got a shot where Hogan Hogan is eyeballing Yokozuna in the ring, and Yokozuna is eyeballing back at him. Back at him. But they put Yoko on the video wall, so the viewers at home are like they're going face-to-face. And then they start doing this match, and it's not like any other Hulkster match, because... Hulk would always get in there, like Nikolai Volkov would start to sing, and Hogan would jump in from behind, and Iron Sheiky would wave in the arena flag, and Sheiky kick his ass, or Hogan kick his ass. Yoko starts to do that whole sumo ceremony, and Hogan is standing back in the sc- in the corner, and he is scurred. This is a different big guy that he's ever fought before. They keep locking up, and Hulk gets shoved down. He keeps going to Jimmy Hart for advice. He doesn't know what to do, and Yoko eventually just takes over and dominates him. Just beats him up. Beats him and beats him and beats him. There's a couple of failed body slams, but Hogan, this is the one giant Hogan was never able to slam. And Hogan gets some flurries of offense, and they always it's a series of clotheslines or a series of boosts, but Yokozuna never, ever goes down. The only time Yoko does go down is like when he misses a splash or misses an elbow or misses a uh, corner charge or whatever. And even when it gets to the point in the match where Hogan will be making his comeback, He's sitting the ropes, and he's sitting Yokozuna, and he goes down. We've never seen Hulk this vulnerable before. Finally, Yoko hits the Uranagi. Hulk kicks out, and Hulk's up. The place is going crazy. The place thinks they know what's going to happen. But Hulk goes, three punches, big boot, Yoko won't go down. Tries it again. Three punches, big boot, Yoko won't go down. A third time, three punches, big boot, Yokozuna finally goes down. Hulk drops the big leg on him. And Yokozuna kicks out at two. I was in the building when Brock Lesnar pinned The Undertaker. It was similar to what happened in this crowd when Yokozuna kicked out of the leg drop. The air just sucked out. I can't believe what they've seen. Now, at this point, something very screwy happens. Uh, Fuji takes the ref or whatever. A, there's a bunch of cameramen at ringside. Some guy dressed like Jimmy Valiant. It's bizarre. Bro. Here's the thing. They actually had, and they, they did this for uh, for WrestleMania, too. They, they had uh, all the photographers around ringside. 
And uh, the story was they're, they're Japanese photographers for the, the newspapers in Japan. And, I mean, to me, it, it's like you should have got one of them and give them the gimmick camera and and do this like it's a uh, like it's a shoot. Because the way it was done, this guy, it was the, 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 he was in this preposterous disguise. And I guess they did do a, a segment afterwards where Fuji was like, camera, what are you talking about? So I guess we're supposed to believe that he hired this guy to to flash Hogan with the exploding camera. But it was like so hokey that it was just begging for some sort of follow-up. And we never got a follow-up. No. no. It was just like it happened. 30 years later, in storyline, we don't know who this cameraman was yeah, and why like, he did Like it. Fuji had the one line about camera, what are you talking about? But like they go backstage after the match and there's Jack Tunney. And I'm waiting for, like, you know, Jack Tunney always had some fucking ruling about something. And uh, all he goes is, just want to congratulate Mr. Fuji and Yokozuna on winning the championship. I'm like, what about the exploding camera and the guy dressed up like Jimmy Valiant? What the fuck was that all about? So No follow-up. Yeah. So if, if, if you don't know what Brian's talking about, a cameraman in a terrible disguise climbed on the apron. Hogan approached, approached him. The camera shot a fireball into Hogan's face like Jericho and Eddie Kingston. And... Uh, Hogan is blinded. Yoko hits the, uh, the not the Mongolian chop, the double throat chop there, which I just hit my camera, hit my mm-hmm. mic. And uh, Hulk goes down, and Yoko drops the Hulk Buster leg on him, pins him with his own move. He is once again WWF champion. He is a st- and there, there was a screwy finish, but for ten minutes, Yokozuna kicked Hulk Hogan's ass, and he beat him. And then after the match, dropped with the the bonsai bonsai drop just for good measure. There was nothing. That Hulk Hogan could have done here more to put Yokozuna over on his way out. Well, not getting flashed by an exploding camera. How is that? Now, I don't know who this cameraman was, but he was either Cheech from Cheech and Chong or it was Inspector Cluso. I'm not sure exactly. This disguise was ridiculous. I don't know how. Uh, I, I can't believe they didn't do anything to follow this up. There was nothing, no backstory. No, no investigation, nothing. Now I know Hulk Hogan left, so why would you do that? But nothing. You know. By the way, speaking of follow-ups, that have nothing to do with his match whatsoever. In that uh, that Luger match with uh, Tatanka, so the match ends and it's a draw, and neither man are going oh, yeah, yeah. up further in the King of the Ring. So uh, Luger, not Tatanka. Luger grabs the mic, and he says, Damn it, I came here to win this King of the Ring, and I'm not leaving without winning. And so, therefore, I want I want five more minutes. And the fucking place goes crazy. They start cheering Luger. And, then of course, he whacks him with the, the form and everything like that. But uh, I think that was like the first tease of uh, of Luger going babyface, which is going to happen very, very soon. Very soon. Because we got the Lex Express right around the corner. Yes. But yes, no follow-up to uh, Jimmy Valiant. Zilch. A very quick Bam Bam Bigelow promo. He's fresh as a daisy. He's got business to take care of. He's going to get the job done. So it's Bret Hart versus Bam Bam. Bam Bam is, in fact, fresh as a daisy. Bret comes out. He's already sweating before the match starts. You know, I got to say one thing before you recap the match. The story of this match was perfect. Bam Bam Bigelow is fresh as a daisy. Bret Hart is fucking a beaten man. 30 minutes already, broken fingers, exhausted. And they did the exact match that they should have done to tell this story. But motherfucker, I was so bored. I was, oh, really? I was, I was so torn by this match because it was like exactly what they should have done. But God damn, Bigelow is just hugging this guy for fucking hours. And I think part of it is I saw Brett have a great match with uh, Scott Hall, where he's Ramon, a fucking great match with Mr. Perfect, and now he's just out here getting hugged and hugged and hugged. I'm like, how fucking long? And they finally do the, the big stuff at the end, and it got good at the end, but it was, I don't know. I was very torn by this match. There was, this is the exact match they should have done. But this shouldn't have been a quote-unquote main event. But you couldn't have put the Hulk Hogan match on last because the fans wouldn't have gone home happy. They really 
in a bind. But technically, there was nothing wrong with the match. But I'm kind of with you, Brian. It was, it was, uh, it got sleepy in in there. Wow. Well, I looked a lot more than you guys did. I it's didn't hate it. I didn't hate it by any means. It certainly was not as good as the Mr. Perfect match. It was probably not as good as the Razor match, though it was so totally different, it's hard to compare. It was Bret Hart hits this ring. He's already wrestled a half hour. He's got to win quicker. He's screwed. He gets about 20 seconds of offense, and he's cut off, and he's done. And after, when he's cut off, he does not get more offense for like 15 minutes. So Bam Bam beats him and beats him and beats him and beats him and beats him. Throws him outside. Luna runs down, hits him with a chair, hits Brett with a chair, throws him into the ring, and Bam Bam hits his top rope headbutt, and the ref counts three. Bam Bam Bigelow is the king of the ring. Uh, d- no. <laughs> I was I was cut off guard, too. I was like, is what this a the Ma- fuck happened? Is this a Mandela effect where Bam Bam was king of the ring and Brett wins the next night or something? But no, no. What happens is a second referee runs down. He says, no, there was a chair shot. This can't be the finish. We're going to restart the match. That takes a minute or two to get sorted out. And then once the bell rings, they restart it. I thought then Brett was going to make his comeback right then. But no, we go right back where we were. Bam, bam, beats him. And, and, beats and him. the thing with the, th- the deal was, him. first Howard Finkel goes, uh, the referee has reversed the decision. And everybody goes crazy. And then Hebner's like, you stupid fucker, that's not what I said. Restart the match. And Howard Finkel has to go, what did he say? I've uh, been corrected. I've been corrected. This match must continue. And Randy Savage is like, the biggest mistake of Howard Finkel's career. And you know Vince was just fucking fuming in the back for Howard just, fucking up. Mm-hmm. And and then the announcers are talking, and they're like totally right in the sense that it fucking should have been reversed. Like, why was the match just restarted? You, you restarted it because he got hit with a chair and then pinned. Well... If you restart it, he still got hit with the chair. So if he gets you. pinned later, are you going to restart the fucking match again? So I, 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 I understand they wanted to do like the swerve or whatever, but I did not like it at all. I thought it was stupid. So the key is judging this match in a vacuum. If you have not seen this show, never watched it before, and you only watch the main event, they'll probably agree with you, Brian. You have to watch it. All in a row. And don't think of it as a match in a vacuum. Think of it as the third fall in a gauntlet match. Because Brett's running a gauntlet. And that's it, it, it's the finish to one, one, one long match that's taken all night. So Bam Bam does not look the same size as Bret Hart. He's way bigger and stronger. And he just whipping him. Brett took a thousand turnbuckle bumps in this match. Front, front, bucks, front bumps, back bumps. He's running these turnbuckles over. And over and over again. And every time, he just is killed. Finally, on the 10,001st cur- turnbuckle bump, he's whipped in, goes in back first, and hits hard. But then Bam Bam charges, and Brett gets his boot up, jumps up, hits a victory roll, and he gets the pin. He's the king of the ring. I mentioned this like a month ago. I forget what we were watching. But Brett had a match, and I, I can't say that I have never seen a bad Bret Hart match. They're very rare, but they exist. But I have never seen a stupid Bret Hart match. No, that's and, absolutely true. And Bret Hart set the stage for this finish against Razor. When he started getting turned whipped in the turnbuckle, his adventures in the turnbuckle started then and lasted for three hours until this very last spot. It was it was beautiful. I enjoy. I thought this match was very, very good, if I will concede the worst of the three. Oh, of course it was, yes. And so, at the end... Brett is just laying on the mat, face up. His mouth is agape. He's breathing hard. He's sweating like crazy. This man has beaten the world. Yeah. And they get in there, and they scurry him off to the platform for this post-match deal. Their pay-per-view time is about to run out. He's got to go. He's got to go out there. So they take him out of the ring. They take him over the interview stage, whatever. There's a throne. There's a scepter. There's a robe and a crown. He's all too happy to put all this stuff on. But then when it's just time to finally speak as king of the WWF, Jerry Lawler interrupts. He's the only king of wrestling. He's doing his king shtick. And it's funny because, like, Brett's also doing a king shtick. And he's watching this other guy who thinks he's the fake king. <laughs> and the look on Brett's face is just like, look at this fucking dork in a, in a king outfit. And he's in a king outfit. Yes. 
Brett's amazing. So Lawler says, I'm in a good mood. I'll let you be a prince of the WWF if you kiss my royal feet. And Brett says, if you're the king, if you're so big on being the king, why were you in this tournament? You don't have the guts to be in there. If you're a king of anything, you're just the Burger King. And he's leading the crowd in Burger King chants and Macho Man is on commentary. Burger King, Burger King. And Lawler is outraged and hits him with a scepter and beats him up and lays him out and rubs his he rubs his feet in Brett's mouth. So Brett had to finally kiss his feet. And there you go. There's your next feud for Brett as they keep him busy for a while. So that show was awesome. I really like the parts we watched. I don't feel a need to go back and watch Sean versus Crush. No, we missed a couple of matches, so it's hard to judge the show as a whole. But, I mean, even if those matches have been horrible, I mean, this was still a really, really good show. Lots of great wrestling, good psychology, a fun tournament. Like, even the match you didn't expect to be all like, well... That Luger match was no good. But Luger match was no good. The even the uh, no Bigelow good. hacksaw was better than you would think. All of yes. Brett's matches were good. Even Hogan and Yokozuna. I mean, it was a good match. It wasn't like a great match. It, I thought but it was, really it was good. good. It was it a was good not, match. It was not the best match in the show, but it was very good. Yeah. So anyway, that was uh, the King of the Ring.